this really kind of amazing bowl back mandolin. This is a fancy model Washburn. It's a style 250 from I'm thinking the 1890s. You'll recall that Washburn was a subsidiary of uh, Lion and Healy, one of the largest North American music manufacturers in the latter half of the 1800s. Bullback mandolins, sometimes called tater bugs depending on where you live, are Neapolitan instruments. These are our direct descendants of the lute, which seems kind of obvious. And this form and kind of building um, solidified during the early 18th century, maybe late 17th, in Italy. Uh, they made their way to America with the first waves of Italian immigration, and they experienced something of a renaissance uh, in America. It was sort of a musical fad, not unlike the ukulele from a few years later. A lot of people started playing them. Every major city had a mandolin orchestra, and Washburn and others met the demand. Neapolitan mandolins have this almond shape, very lute-like, kind of like a pear. They also have what we call a cranked top. There's this abrupt bend right behind the bridge. And this is accomplished by heat bending. Uh, when you look inside these, there's often a scorch mark on the underside that corresponds with that. Um, what this does is allow for a fairly low bridge height, but lots of break angle which is something that often goes awry when you try and fit like a tailpiece like this on a standard flat top guitar, for instance. There's just not enough downward pressure a lot of the time. We've seen that a few times on this channel. But again, the corresponding angle to that has to be cut and planed into the bowl, and this is all handwork. Like, the level of craft in this thing is astounding. The white material is ivory, everything else is Brazilian rosewood, of a quality that you cannot find today. The fretboard here, that is not perloid plastic. That is all real mother of pearl. The crazy thing is just how much work goes into making one of these things. Um, bold back stave construction like this is light years more laborious than slapping together a guitar. Uh, and this one is in phenomenal shape, due in large part to the case. You guys got to look at this thing. A whole lot of these old mandolins, they got hung on a wall. It's a decorative piece at some point, and they just deteriorate. This one still has the formed and tooled leather case. And this thing, as an object, is just amazing. Uh, it's kind of like half a basketball mixed up with a gun holster and it gives me the impression of saddlery. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if these things were farmed out to an actual saddle-making shop, which in the 1890s would have been a going concern. Um, but it's just phenomenal. It's really heavy leather. There's remnants of an ancient paper label there, with the date 1893. And there's a stamp here, trademark, warranted, registered July 1893 again with uh, a musical staff, with a rather happy-looking hairy cow. Nice heavy straps and buckles. And this just hinges open. There's a yellowish, fuzzy material inside. And the mandolin fits perfectly in there. I'm just in love with this thing. So what's the deal? It won't hold tuning. I think the tuners took a hard knock on the side at some point, and something got deformed in there. Uh, and a couple of them just won't hold tuning at all. Uh, the caretaker of this instrument took it to another very well-respected shop to see if anything could be done. They tried some things, eh, not quite satisfactory. Went to another mandolin maker who looked at it and then suggested it should come to me. So I guess it's my problem now. The issue is, these tuners are an odd size. Uh, they're not the standard spacing from post to post, and they're not the standard diameter. These are about 150 thousandths, uh, which is very small. It's about mm, 3.7 millimeters. Could I find a set of these somewhere? I've looked. 
no luck. The thing is, they want to play it. It's never going to get played again if I don't do something. And that might mean retrofitting and modifying modern tuners to work and possibly reaming out these holes, which is a pretty irreversible decision. The crazy thing is, despite all of the work that went into making these, of exceptional materials too, they're worth practically nothing in comparison to other simpler instruments of that era, guitars of the 1890s, or the carved back Gibson mandolins that came 15 or 20 years down the road. Martin made these too. I recall Chris Martin saying that of all the instruments the company ever produced, their fancy bullback mandolins would be the hardest and most expensive thing to try and reproduce today. They couldn't do it profitably because they'd have to retail for ten or twelve thousand dollars a piece. And again, there is no market for these. I shouldn't say that. There is a market for individual luthier-built instruments from Italy from earlier in the 19th century. Those get up into the multiple thousands of dollars. Um, those are vintage ones in fantastic shape. But that is very much an Italian cultural thing dealing with Italian music and craftsmanship. It does not translate over into the American market. So, you know, something like this might make $1,500. Might make on a really, really good day. So I'm stuck with this weird situation where is it desecration if I modify it? I like to think it's adding value in this case because it is unplayable and I don't know. I just don't know. So why aren't they appreciated today? Well, they have a very short scale length compared to a modern Gibson style mandolin. They're a full inch shorter and uh, they don't, the sound is perfect if you're doing, you know, an on-stage production of The Godfather, but it doesn't translate to the bluegrass stuff that people want to play. Uh, the other thing is just playability issues. The frets on here are the smallest I've ever seen. They're about 30 thousandths wide by 10 thousandths tall. So it's almost like playing fretless, but it's not. And if anything's out of alignment, there's nothing you can dress down. <laughs> So, they kind of are what they are. Okay, looking inside. It's funny that we're missing a couple of screws that don't appear to have ever been drilled. And also we've got different materials for the gears. Some appear to be steel, others appear to be brass. Uh, also, the shafts of the tuners are graduated to conform to this curved shape. And I can see in a couple of areas, this one in particular, someone has come along and dented this, trying to expand the gear out with um, a little punch. Maybe to try and firm it up on the shaft, it's possible this was just spinning freely. But despite their robust construction, I mean these look, and they are, high quality tuners, they're not working great. Like there's some slop, and this one is, it binds in one direction. This is, it's really this one here that's the real culprit. It gets halfway and it just sort of unreels like a fishing line, and then it gets really solid in one point. So it just, you know, you can't tune it. And this one is not great either. Ugh. So for comparison's sake, here is a modern tuner. Uh, the spacing is infuriatingly close. I mean, I might be able to do something with that, actually. That's not too bad. I think these are 22 and a half millimeters from center to center, thereabouts. And this guy is going to be closer to 23. Yeah. Just about, yeah, so it's, they're like a half millimeter off. 
you know, there's, there's like a difference of maybe one millimeter from side to side here. Uh, center to center on that one is 67. On this one, it's like 69. So, gee, but that's close. I think, you know, if I am going to be reaming out the front holes, I can probably adjust for that. However, the tuner shafts are going to be an issue because these ones on the outside edges are probably 10 millimeters versus 7. So, if I were to install these, there'd be no way to turn the upper and lower ones. They'd be rubbing up against the wood. Uh, they probably couldn't go right in. I don't know. Maybe I... Hmm. Maybe I could pull these out somewhat. Put different buttons on them. But I'm not sure I would get three millimeters worth of extra travel. That's infuriating. The next issue is the plate width. We've got something here that's probably around oh, 15 and a half, maybe 16 millimeters. The modern one, I think that's closer to 17 and a bit, which means in order to make these fit into these recesses, I would have to grind off like maybe a millimeter off either side, which is dangerous because these have the little um, post holders peened over into that uh, area. So if I cut into those, the posts start wobbling and there's no tuner left. So other option would be to route these wider, which is probably the better option, I think. Um, it's just a strange design. I've seen other washburns from this era with more standard tuners that look like this, rather than this inset kind of deal. Don't know why they did that. Uh, the other option, of course, would be to plug this, take the tuners out, and then just re-drill. And we'd have plenty of room for that. So that's probably the sane choice, would be to plug these in and then, you know, see if we could angle this plate. Yeah, I think that would function. There's probably just enough room to make that work. So I think, you know, if I can't come up with another set of these, that's what I'm going to do. Two weeks later. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's a good day. Against all odds. And I mean, this is a real million to one thing. I managed to find a set of tuners. I put a picture up on Instagram, engaged the hive mind, and John, in Houston, Texas, recalled a damaged Mando that seemed similar. He went and had a look, and oh yeah, we're in business. I got killed on the customs brokerage fees, but such is life. I also learned from my friend, fellow repair guy Nathaniel Adams, that Lion and Healy had its own in-house machine shop until about 1920, where they could make and plate their own tuners and could change or customize for different models. So it is genuinely a nightmare sometimes. If you're trying to get an exact match for something, it's not possible. Uh, a lot of people were interested in helping with these, but they all had tuners of more standard dimensions and just it, none of them were going to work. But these ones, I think, are. These ones are brass all over. They have slightly larger gears, but the plate size and the spacing look the same. And here's the thing, the shafts for the buttons are thicker, but so are the ones that go through the headstock versus these tiny little ones from the original. Why is that important? Well, I'm betting that this set is a few years younger than this. If these are 1894, these might be like 1899, because I think they learned their lesson. One thing that many people missed when looking at that Instagram post is that these gears are situated above the shaft, whereas modern ones it's reversed. The gears are on the bottom side. They're towards the body of the guitar. What happens when string tension pulls against the tuners here, the shafts, 
it sort of tips the far end towards the bridge. And this side, the gear side, is pulled away from the threads that engage it. On modern tuners, the gears are pulled into the threads, maintaining that relationship between the parts, um, lessening the wear on them, and also you know, limiting the opportunity for them to get out of sync. But if you add a super small diameter shaft that can bend or distort, you end up with an equation for a really weird eccentric orbit, sometimes with hit and miss contact between the essential surfaces. So even though these ones, the new ones, aren't an exact match, they will likely perform better. This does mean that I'm going to have to widen the shaft holes and possibly these little cutouts for the shafts on the side here, but I think we can live with that. Yeah, the spacing lines up. That's good. Try and clean these up a little bit. These buttons appear to be made of that very early um, fake ivory celluloid plastic. Ones on the original, I think were actually... Yeah, they're also a plastic. I thought they might have been bone at first, but no, they're also celluloid. These shafts are sized to fit a quarter inch hole, 250 thousandths, 6.3 millimeters. I think I prefer not to drill these holes. I'm going to ream them from both sides. Yeah, these cutouts for the shafts are in fact too snug. I have to carve away a little piece on either side to make those fit. This whole arrangement is entirely too delicate. It's not designed to bump into anything, that's for sure. Okay, very close, but not quite. Again, if you're making tuners batch by batch, um, you can afford to have them slightly different lengths depending on who's setting up the slot mortiser day by day. So I think, um, yeah, it's literally like a millimeter off the end here. Peel a little bit off. It's a very much a hand-fitting operation. Okay, so that's the right length, but the cutout for this shaft is still too narrow. The other ones fit fine. Okay, got a set of strings. Went with some D'Addario light gauge which are amongst the lightest lights that you're going to find for mandolin strings. These are 10 to 34. Oftentimes you'll see 38, 40, maybe even 42 for the low course. Uh, however, I want to keep this thing under as little tension as possible, given its age and construction. Restringing mandolins can be annoying, even at the best of times. I find it helps a little to take some pliers and squeeze some of the roundness out of the end loop because, well, that has to be pulled out anyway um, during the tuning process. It can take a while. This sort of gives it a bit of a head start and it's just easier to seat them on the little hooks. Well, I'm very happy. Just tickled because these tuners are excellent. They're smooth and steady and they work just like brand new tuners. Couldn't be better. One thing about these old mandolins is you really want to be wearing glasses when you're bringing them up to pitch for the first time because they all have this outsplayed tuner configuration that virtually guarantees a couple of strings are going to end up rubbing against the adjacent string posts. It's just the design. It's a leftover from the 18th century. Uh, it doesn't matter the diameter of the post either. They're just that way. So if you've got really old strings on these and you're trying to raise the pitch a bunch, just be aware because it could go ping. Other than that, it sounds fantastic. 
really, really does. I think we may be sleeping on these. Ergonomically, well, bullback instruments are just sort of an awkward physical presence. There's no getting around that. They don't hug the body, and your arms are always going to be much farther forward than if you're playing a Gibson. So it does take some getting used to. I think I'd kind of want a strap. But even then, these things, um, they tend to be oddly balanced, you know. They want to tip backwards so much that, you know, you got to sort of wrestle them into position. But you do get used to it. Um, I'd love the frets to be twice as tall, but refretting something like this would require a lot of work. Probably with the Dremel to enlarge all the slots. But, you know, they're level enough to play. Let me fumble through a few things, we'll hear how it sounds. Just a little update on the sticker situation. Tremendous response. Uh, I got a few paper cuts this week. So I'm about to take these to the post office. These are going to all corners of the globe. And I'm really proud of you guys because together we have raised at this moment $775 for Palestinian medical relief. Pretty cool. So once again, if you want a sticker, you can either send me $5 uh, to my PayPal. The link is in the description. Or you could also sign up to my Patreon. That link is also in the description. Up next we're going to go back and work on the Gibson CF100, which you'll remember is the reset where the soundboard was put over top of the dovetail. Uh, the old Gibson from 1954. And of course during the uh, removal I had to use a bunch of steam. And um, the lacquer that was on top of the heel kind of just sloughed away. So I have to retouch this, obviously. So I'm going to sand back with some 220 grit. I'll make that smooth and pleasant. I'll put on a couple of coats of pretty heavy cut shellac. It's like two and a half, three pound, which will act as a sanding sealer. Okay, to match the color on this neck, this is a pretty standard Gibson tobacco brown. I'm going to start off with three colors. I'll use a, a raw sienna which has got a slight reddish cast to it um, because this does have a slight red undertone. And I'll go in with some burnt sienna which is very much more brown and finally some Van Dyke brown in a very small amount because this is a slightly more opaque sort of tint um, and I find it helps to sort of blend in things a bit more. Now these necks tend to be darker in and around the heel just as a matter of course when they get sprayed at the factory more finish builds up there so Things tend to be darker, and, it, and that also helps us kind of camouflage any sort of damage along the sides of the heel. I've got one little spot here that could use some. So I've lightly scuff sanded the surface with some 600 grit sandpaper, and uh, it's ready to spray. There are a few other areas along the neck which I will do drop fills on. With um, the lacquer, I'll show that too. I'm going to start with a little bit of lacquer thinner. Actually, I actually already have some lacquer in here from another repair that I'm working on. Uh, but I just want this to be a fairly thin mixture. So I'll go with the lacquer thinner first and then add the lacquer until it's got the consistency I want. I've got my trusty old can of Watco Clear High Gloss. And this mixture, I want it to be on the thin side because I want that thinner to flash off pretty quickly. And uh, that'll help me avoid getting drips and runs and help me sort of um, build the finish up fairly quickly because I can put a lot of color on in one application. So I'm going to go with about three big pipettes worth. And I'm not going to need a huge amount of this. So that looks and feels about right. Um, what's right? It's hard to say. It's not water. It's just slightly thicker than water whatever that means. I'll add several drops of each of the colors in varying proportions until I get the tone that I'm looking for 
and also the density of color that seems about right. I do I test that by sort of pulling it up on the side of the cup there and seeing what it looks like, you know, on a thin layer. Does it tint enough that I'm not going to have to put on half an inch of lacquer to get the color I need? Okay, I got my mask on and my goggles on and ready to spray. This ding on the back of the neck is in a place where you can really feel it with your thumb if you're sliding up to the 12th fret. So I'm going to fill that, but first I want to get enough color in there so that it matches the rest of the neck reasonably well. I'll start off by cleaning the area with some naphtha. I'll take a little of my tinted lacquer, and just sort of let it flow into the recess there. This is not like paint. You can't really brush it. You just sort of have to drop it in, hence the term drop fill. There's another couple of little spots in the back of the headstock that could use some color. Then I'll spray on several coats of clear and drop some clear lacquer into those dents as well. There's a little missing piece of lacquer over the fingerboard extension there, which was pretty yellow, so I hit it with some neck amber in a rattle can. Just enough. That's about right. When everything's had a chance to dry, I will lightly undercut the front face of the heel, the end grain surface that contacts the body. This doesn't have to be super deep, and it really only has to happen down towards the uh, bottom end of the heel here. Um, you can go too far with this. Just a little bit is all that's necessary. Before I get into the process of refitting the dovetail, there's this little spot down the back of the neck, right in the center, which is delaminated. There's a little thin crack, and on either side, the lacquer has come away from the shaft of the neck. So I want to lock that down. I'm going to run some thin super glue into the crack while pressing it in uh, on both sides there, trying to get that to fill the void. In a couple of spots, the void isn't accessible, so I'll actually puncture it with the tip of my scalpel and then squirt a little of the glue in there. And we can see the sort of ghostly looking um, stuff inside there goes away. And by squeezing it back and forth, I can sort of draw it in by a capillary action or rub things down a bit as well. This will later get sanded, the surface I mean. Uh, but if we weren't careful, the whole thing could slough off at some point and it would be very sharp on your thumb, probably give you a bad cut at the time, uh, and also create a surface which is just really nasty. So better to lock this down before we start moving the neck around too much. Usual trick of pulling the sandpaper through the heel joint to correct the angle. I've talked about this a lot in the past year on various reset jobs, so I won't discuss it at length here. On guitars like this Gibson that don't have a plastic heel cap, it's just the wood on the end of the heel, it helps to put a little bit of thin super glue in this area because it's very easy to pull fibers up with the sandpaper. Um, they can sort of split off into the visible area of the heel. So I just saturate the area with some super glue and lock that down before I start sanding too much. So I'll sand away the little nubbin in the center of the heel, which isn't touched by the sandpaper when I'm doing the sides and that eventually holds the heel off the surface of the body until you can get rid of it. With the neck angle corrected I can glue on some strips of veneer on either side of the dovetail and use those to sneak up on a perfect fit which should be quite snug and there should be no rocking when it's uh, fully seated there. I mean this you could string this thing up now and it would not come loose. Um, no rocking back and forth in any direction. I replaced the 15th fret, but because I used the steam needle to remove this neck, the holes left behind are a little bit larger in diameter than the ones from the foam cutters. Uh, 
especially with this extremely thin vintage wire, they protrude out past the edges of the fret. So I've got to fill that up. I've made a little uh, concoction here using some rosewood dust and some glue, basically my own wood filler. And I'll squeeze that down into the hole and they disappear pretty nicely. Polishing, polishing, polishing. The old saddle is so low, even my fret pullers can't get a grip. And it's fairly snug, too. But there's always a way. So I made a new, taller saddle. Got that strung up. Okay, it's all in one piece. I've still got some touch-up work to do around the fingerboard extension and where the heel meets the cutaway, the back of the neck, etc. But that's as far as I'm going to take it for this video. I'm just going to let this settle in for a while and see if any more adjustments are necessary. The action's good. I'm happy with the amount of saddle height. And, um, you know, Gibson always throwing a curveball at me with the top-over dovetail. Let's hear how it sounds.